Welcome to another unboxing video. I've got a lot to get through, so buckle up. Some of these in particular are very pertinent to projects a lot of you keep asking me about. First off, some of the simple things like this, which is an Admiral channel plate for a set like one of these. I, for whatever reason, tend to attract a lot of uh, Admiral sets, so very nice to have one of these spares just sitting on eBay. Nobody bidding on it, so I got it quite inexpensively. Now this was sent by one of my online fans. You see me do various recapping projects and working with cup plates. So he was going through some stuff at work and found some new old stock capacitors, probably for all American fives, and some cup plates probably used in the audio detectors for all American fives. So I may very well come across a radio where the caps have been cut out, replaced with ugly modern stuff, and I can use these to restuff and get them looking original again. So thanks for that. Now this one, well every now and then I, I buy stuff on eBay and I don't look at who the seller is. And I suspect this seller didn't look to see who the buyer was because this is one of the longtime Video Karma members. And uh, I think Brian will be surprised if he sees his video to see what uh, I intend to use these for. These are the legs off of, I believe, a uh, mid-60s console uh, TV, probably a combo TV radio phonograph. Well, what I want to use them for is a radio, some of you may recall. Here's the radio I'm talking about. It's my RCA 222, which at some point in the past had its legs cut off. Probably back in the 30s, maybe 40s. The reason its legs got cut off is that it was to modernize it. Radios in the 20s, like the one it's sitting on top of, had these long turned legs. This is probably from a, from 29. This one I think is from maybe 32. So it had shorter legs, but it still had legs. By the time you get to the mid, late 30s, console radios didn't have legs anymore. Maybe just a little riser, but not long legs. So somebody cut it off to modernize it. Well, so I really like this radio, and since then I've, I've kind of tentatively asked around to see if somebody could replicate them. And haven't gotten really any good leads, and I know it would cost... A fair amount of money if I wanted to really get them looking exactly like the originals. Because not only were there legs, which were probably a bit complex to replicate, but there's also a, a shelf that connected them. They kind of reflected the same oval pattern here. Actually, there were a couple different styles, but I like the oval one the best. Well, so in, in lieu of having somebody make new replica legs or learning how to do it myself, Every now and then I search on eBay for vintage legs, and I came across these. So imagine these are attached uh, down here. Uh, if you flip this over, there's like a one-inch dowel that was cut off. And uh, I think I could attach these to that same point. And these are quite similar to the originals, which also bumped out uh, a bit. The, the, the main major difference being the originals had fluting like this kind of came down and around, but, and these are it's about two inches shorter than the originals, but if I can manage to attach these, it's a great starting point. We get this thing off the ground finally, and uh, it wouldn't look all that bad, so I think that will be a fun little project. Now this I haven't looked inside yet. I think I know what it is. Let's see. Interesting way to pack it. Alright, I'll have to cut that open. Here's what was inside all that aluminized bubble wrap. Looks like your standard octal metal tube, right? until you turn it around. Hey! That's actually a one-inch cathode ray tube. 
RCA 913. Kind of hard to come by because they didn't make these for very long. Pre-war, I think maybe for a couple years, like 38 to 40, something in that ballpark. And only RCA made them and they didn't use them in a whole lot. I know there's at least one little bitty kind of training oscilloscope and I imagine these found their way into some communication gear as well for monitors. Well, I had one of these way back. I picked it up in the 80s and I made a little oscilloscope around it, which didn't work all that great, so I eventually kind of scrapped it out and reused the parts. And somewhere over the years, I lost my 913. Since then, they don't show up too often, they can be kind of pricey, so. I was happy to see this with a reasonable a buy it now a few days ago and picked it up. A little dirty, a little rusty. They say the filament has continuity. I don't see any phosphor burns, so it's cool. Uh, don't have any easy way to test it right now other than the filament, but eventually I may play around with that. It's green phosphor, it's not for a TV. It'd be more like for an oscilloscope. Electrostatic focus. I'll uh, pull up a schematic and show you how they get away with having a full-fledged CRT with only 8 pins. A quick web search turned up this page showing a rather pristine one with its original box. And they say it came out in 36. And didn't sell too well, so it was phased out and quickly became Rather expensive. Alright, here. There's a great resource at this website. It's got tons of data. So let's see, where is 913? Here we go. So a typical 6.3 volts AC, 600 milliamps for the filament. And it looks like you only need 500 volts. Oh, and that's max. So, well, typical 250 to 500 for amp 2, 50 to 100 amp 1. So, fortunately I don't have a power supply that will go up to 500 volts or even a couple, or even 250, but if I did, I can hook it up now for the internals of it. It's a little test circuit. So the way they get away with this is two of the deflection plates are tied together and go to a common. So if you want to deflect this, typically what you would do is you tie to the two plates to a fixed potential. Then you got to swing positive and negative of that potential to get the beam to deflect fully uh, up, down, and left and right in one side of the cathode. Or the cathode, rather, is going to one, on one side of the heater. So, if you ever come across one, a neat little thing to play around with. But because of their scarcity, uh, you might want to just hang on to it instead of risking burning it out. And here is one of the little itty bitty scopes. National CRM Oscilloscope, introduced in 1937. Only $11.10, less tubes. And $5.81 for the tube kits. Here's a picture of it actually running. So, <laughs> it's about as basic a scope as you're going to get. There aren't even any labels on any of the knobs. But hey, it works. circuit inside so for your tube kit you get all of two tubes <laughs> most notably the CRT and then they throw in a 6x5 rectifier 
so no amplifiers. Your external signal has to be large enough amplitude to deflect those plates. Alright, now things should get a little more interesting. There's a reason why this box is on top of my national TV that I recently showed in a video. So, as I mentioned in the video on that national set, basically all the knobs are missing. Thanks to help from some online friends who have this set or had reference photos, I uh, it was able to determine that there are several variations. I was right in my assumption that this is the original fine tuning knob. The correct channel selector knob is actually a chicken head knob. A slight variation of the common one you see in test equipment. So I'll have to dig through my uh, knob stash to see if I can dig one up. And even if I can't, I think just any old brown chicken head knob will look good enough. But these are definitely not the originals. There should be a knob similar to this over here. And these four, well, hopefully we'll see in a moment what they should look like. Somebody gave me a tip that, well, I got two tips. One, that there are national radios that use similar knobs. So I've been looking around for those. No luck so far, but there's also what's in here. Well, they sure didn't skimp on the packing materials, double box and a whole bunch of bubble wrap. What's in there? Ta-da! It is a booster. Plenty of outfits made TV boosters, not especially rare, except when you get into something like this, which is actually a national branded matching TV booster with the same type of knobs as this. So this knob is what I'm looking for. I need four of those, or if I chose to, I could pop one off of here in the 93, but these seem to be pretty scarce, and this one is so nice, I can't see taking the knobs off. Because that was a suggestion I got, is to, hey, look for some of these boosters, get them cheap, and pull the knobs off of the TV. But I want to leave this intact and keep it with the TV. I think that would be a very cool match set. So what does this do? Well, if you're in a weak reception area, you hook up your antenna to this and it has an RF amp. I don't know how much gain it's supposed to give you, 3 dB, I don't know, but what these actually really tend to do is they amplify the reflections and the noise and all, so I think they're of dubious value, but then again, I wasn't around back in the day when these were being used, so hey, maybe they work better than I think. And I think this is just, well, I don't know what this is, it just seems to turn into turn, turn. maybe a variable capacitor to tune this in. But then again, there's one here too. What I thought this would do is it would just be clicked, just a two position on off switch. But of course, it could be broken. Well, anyways, I don't really expect to restore this and get it working. So nice brass plate here, and this does say tuning on it. So this outer knob, this paddle knob, and this inner fine tuning, that's what was used on other variations of this set. But uh, this one, uh, this uses the chicken headed knobs. At first I was thinking I could transplant this if I chose to onto the TV. Not the solder plate necessarily, but the inner stuff, but no. Nope. Uh, anyways, so this metal box painted brown, it's a nice shape. Back is just a big copper plate. That's where the switch is. Well, so I might as well uh, take a moment to pop this open. Just three quarter inch nuts holding it together. I pulled this knob off easily enough. If everybody has any of these lying around in their junk box, please let me know. Alright, so to get the other knob off, there are some such screws. I think this is about right. Finally, jeez.
Alright, so, wow, <laughs> certainly copper plated, Same rectifier, single tube, very well shielded, and, uh, well, tuner, I can see one of them plugins is damaged, similar to an Admiral uh, turret tuner, which I think is made by Standard Coil or Sucks or Tarzan or something like that. But those are two individual sections. This just has one. I've opened these up before and they didn't have full blown like turret TV tuners inside of them. They certainly weren't copper plated. Not that I want to power this up. Even if it did work, I don't know what's it going to do for me. <laughs> I suppose I could rig up a feeble transmitter and then see if this boosts it, but. Uh, necessary. I just wanted to check out what the inside of this might look like. Certainly higher quality than your standard TV booster, that's for sure. I tightened up some loose screws on the back plate, popped in those channels. They popped out and as far as what that shaft does that kept turning and turning, well that's this. Which is grounded along its length and then there's a little pick off here. Copper sleeve running inside of something. So this might be threaded inside and there's a variable capacitor in there or maybe there's a tuning slug moving in and out. No idea. This is probably in the rider service info though, because not only does the rider's TV service info have TV info, it also has uh, info on UHF converters and boosters like this. I wonder what this went to. I didn't have any luck finding service info for this in the rider's service manuals online anywhere, so I just started tracing out the circuit. Pretty simple. AC comes in, got a switch, go to the primary of a power transformer, secondary, one side's grounded, other side, halfway of selenium rectifier, filter cap, and then it supplies the rest of it. There's also a, a 6.3 volt uh, filament winding for the one tube. So right now I've got my meter attached to that point right there. And when I turn it on, we do get B plus. Hey, the neon light just came on. When I first powered this up, it was down to about 77 volts, and it's been climbing and climbing. I'm guessing that cap is reforming. And I guess I finally hit the threshold for the neon light. All right. So what I kind of want to do with this, just for an indicator, is uh, to make this safe to power up and to do that well there really are only two components that would be any concern to me that's a selenium rectifier and a one electrolytic capacitor uh, do I want to change them out or just leave them in uh, I don't know I don't know because uh, there's also the historical significance of this this is all original they don't seem to be all that common so now I think I'll just leave it as is Works right now. Um, now that I can see how dim that neon bulb is, I'm thinking this is powered up. It's probably awfully dim, anyways. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'll just leave it alone. There it is, all back together. I guess this unboxing video kind of turned into a little restoration video, but <laughs> so be it. I now see that the power switch, in addition to the being one on the front, or rather on the back, the slide switch is actually one on the front too. But I wonder if that really turns the unit off or does that just uh, bypass the uh, RF amp, I don't know. Some clunker works. And as for that little light, well, not the brightest thing in the world. Lights off. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty darn feeble. So, I don't know, it looks like maybe it's not up all the way, but even if it was, 
Ah, uh, a little neon bulb like that is not exactly the brightest dial lamp. Here's one more look at it on top of the TV. Now, this TV sparked more interest than I was really expecting. And also another collector restorer got one just a few weeks ago. So I think I'm going to start working on this sooner than I was originally planning on it. Also, since I've now seen the insides, it looks like a pretty simple restore. And since it uh, is all original or pretty darn close, I will attempt to restuff the caps, all the paper caps. There aren't that many anyways. Alright, now we come to the main course of this box. Now what do you suppose might be in here? Well, there's another set I got fairly recently that's also sparked an awful lot of interest and that would be the Scott 6T11 projection set. And to refresh your memory, that set has a lot of water damage on top, so I want to rebuild the cabinet, which will require me getting my hands on a table saw, learning how to use it, and of course building the top. But also, there was a lot of damage to the internals, not, not the main chassis, not the electronics, but the optics. The front surface mirrors, all grungy and nasty, and the worst part was the um, corrective lens that's pretty crucial to the operation of the set was all foggy I don't know if it's got mold or mildew in it it's got some kind of organic gel I think in there well that's <laughs> I think it's beyond salvaging and I would have to find a substitute or so I thought until this showed up on eBay a few weeks ago and I'm still Kind of shocked that it did. I'm sure some of you saw this on Video Karma. There was some discussion of it. What is it? Well, it's a whole protogram optical kit. New old stock, as near as I could tell. So, for example, with the Scott TV, well, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So here's the Scott. Now, the front end, all the electronics, the power supply, the tuner, the deflection circuits, that was designed and made by them, or they had it subcontracted, whatever. But the optical stuff, the stuff that actually makes the pictures, this stuff was made in the Netherlands by Philips. And numerous manufacturers used exactly the same stuff, which comprised the high voltage box, the picture tube, and the optical stuff, this box, which has a concave mirror and then a mirror at a 45 degree angle and then this corrective filter in the middle. And then there's a certain mirror up here. So, back in the day, I believe you could buy this stuff as a kit to experiment on your own or manufacturers would buy them. So what's in these boxes are those three components. Pitcher tube, new old stock. That should be the high voltage supply and this should be the optical assembly. Here are the three boxes out of the big box. Uh, I was getting real nervous when I took this out because I heard junk rattling around inside. My immediate thought was, oh crap, the pitcher tube broke. No, what it was is this. I think I found this floating around in the Scott set as well. I don't know what it is exactly or where it goes, but there it is. Next is a rubber band here. No, it appears to be okay. So, yeah, this little dinky 3-inch picture tube, 3NP4, that's it. So it's 20 something, I don't know, 25,000 volts running through this puppy. And that gets incredibly bright. Now, mine might be okay, I don't know. All I could check was for filament continuity because this is a triode. Oh, the gutter's good. 
That's always a good sign. So there's only a few pins on the base. And I don't I don't even think all of these are used. So basically you got your two filament, cathode, and a grid. And then this is your anode. So unless you hook this up to substantial voltage, no current flows, you can't test the emissions. And if you were to hook this up to say 25,000 volts with no deflection coils, you will blow a hole right through the phosphor. Similarly in the set when it's running, if say you lose vertical, you get a horizontal line burn into this almost instantly. So I know there are other guys out there looking for this and uh, for sure there were some other bidders and I'm sorry if I uh, outbid any of you but uh, I really wanted this and uh, uh, I don't know where I was going with that exactly but yeah there was some uh, first bidding I was the only bidder for like a week and then as usual right at the last second there was uh, uh, some intense well uh, a couple a couple hot bids so this would be the high voltage supply and this doohickey is what plugs into that so the paint's chipped so I couldn't quite tell from the listing if this was really used or not or if it had just been getting kicked around all well, these wire at leads are stripped but it doesn't look like they were ever soldered to anything well, the one is twisted around a little it's hard to say somebody might have hooked it up temporarily just to test it Serial number doesn't mean anything. One, two, two, eight, four. Maybe they made 12,000 plus of these. Seems like a lot, but uh, I don't know. Here's a better look at the other two components. So here's the high voltage supply. This end plugs into that cup on the CRT, and then this hooks up to. Oh, B plus, ground, maybe, and maybe a control voltage, maybe brightness control, something like that. So I've heard some guys say that if you want to test one of these, what you can do, hook up a filament supply, plug this into it, power this sucker up, and keep the brightness turned on real glow, and look for a spot on the face of the CRT. I don't quite have the nerve to do that, but uh, I, may, I may later, as I get more familiar with this set, I don't want to risk burning anything out. And this is the piece I'm most interested in. Now it's, I, I was wrong, this is not a complete kit because it doesn't have any of the CRT mounting hardware. There's no yoke, there's no focus coil, there's no CRT mount which would all go in here. So the CRT shines into this end and it hits a uh, circular convex mirror. So it shines that way, it shines and then bounces back and hits this mirror at a 45 degree angle and does a circle cut into it and it shines straight up through this. And this is what's all cloudy in mine. This one's a little grungy at the edges, but otherwise much better. There's some rust, but I can work on cleaning that off. All right, so I don't know, I get asked a lot about when am I gonna work on this? I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> There's so much work to do. I wanna get a table saw and like I said, and, and rebuild that top and, uh, and I got a lot of other stuff I want to want to deal with first, so it'll be much more uh, likely that this will be coming up before the Scott. But there is nothing hindering me from working on the Scott now. Well, that is it for the unboxing. Hope you guys enjoyed this look. That's some of my latest finds. Don't go away just yet. Before I had a chance to upload this video, another box showed up. I thought this wouldn't be here until tomorrow. This was just a uh, an impulse kind of thing. I've talked about blonder tongue modulators a few times in the past, and so have plenty of other TV vintage TV enthusiasts. That is a commercial modulator. You feed in your audio and your video and you get RF out. And the nicer ones are called Agile Modulators where you can dial in the channel that you would want. 
from like channel 2 to oh, into the UHF range. And they originally designed to drive coax for like hotel motel situations, but they have enough power you can actually attach a small antenna to it and cover a few hundred feet. Well, they are not the only game in town. I did not realize that Drake also makes one. Because the uh, blonder tongues, they're starting to get a little bit pricier, a little bit harder to find. Cause, you know, the word has gotten out. Well, somebody on the Antique Radio Forum was asking about them, and he came across these Drake units. So I thought, oh, they look kind of interesting, an interesting alternative. So uh, I hopped onto eBay, and there was one that uh, the guy showed it tested and working, and free shipping. So well, that is what this is. There's about a mile of black saran wrap around this thing, and then some foam padding. Finally, here it is. It's ice cold. Out in a cold truck or whatever for a long time. So here's what you do in your, your channels. So right away I like this because the blonder tongues use little dip switches. And you gotta know binary to figure out what channel you're dialing in. So that's a nice touch. Monitor, it's probably a low power tap on output. It's so very similar to the blonder tongue where you got audio and video modulation levels, output level. That's interesting, you can set, I assume that means the audio to video carrier strength ratio. Now the best part is this. It's got meters. Who doesn't like meters? So, something more to look at than the uh, just a black panel. It would be even cooler if they're backlit. Well, this is interesting enough. I want to do a dedicated video just on this because I want to dig up a manual and, and read about uh, all the finer points of using it. All these are just feedback cables in case you wanted to insert something into this chain. You could. Built-in fuse, which is a nice touch. Interesting. So the audio... Oh, huh. So the video in, and it looks like audio in can either be RCA or 600 ohm impedance, I'm guessing that is. Maybe balanced or unbalanced. Weird. 115 volts AC, that's a little weird too. It's awfully low. Well, like I said, I want to read up a bit on this before just plugging it in and just firing it up. There's one thing to be aware of when you're dealing with these that have pretty high output power. Is that if you don't hook up the output right, you can fry the uh, RF amps. If you don't terminate things right, and you get a lot of reflection. So this is a model VM2410A. Alright, well that is really going to be it for this unboxing video.